Am I audible? Perfect. Yes. So let me just minimize this. this so the topic that, that I'm going to talk uh, is DMEC, a simple approach to successful surgery. I practice at Apollo Hospitals in Hyderabad in India. Uh, Sergio, my slides are not moving forward. Is there? Uh, just try clicking over the slide. Let's see if. Uh... Okay. Yeah, it's moving if I click on the slide. So when we talk about uh, DMEC, DMEC stands for Decimates Membrane Endothelial Keratoplasty. By the end of this presentation, DMEC will stand for definitely most easy keratoplasty. Endothelial keratoplasty, the advantage over penetrating keratoplasty is that it avoids any kind of surface incision or sutures, resulting in a smoother surface topography, faster wound healing, thereby faster visual rehabilitation. Since the surgery is performed through a smaller incision, you have greater tectonic stability and you have reduced rejection rate compared to a full thickness graft. If we look at the the surgical trend in the United States, we find that more and more people are doing endothelial keratoplasty as compared to full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. And among the, uh, if we look at the evolution of endothelial keratoplasty, uh, it started off uh, with Gerrit Mellis from Netherlands describing the posterior lamellar keratoplasty or the deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty as described by Mark Terry in the United States. And this was not very popular because it also involved uh, dissection in the host cornea and you had to cut out a central eight millimeter disc and then you had to try and fit in an eight millimeter donor lenticule within this space. When I started out back in 2003, 2004, this was the surgery that I started out with. It was more challenging to perform. However, we, as the surgery, the evolution of endothelial keratoplasty progressed, you came across decimate stripping endothelial keratoplasty, which involved only removal of the post decimus membrane followed by uh, inserting the donor lenticule and opposing it using an air bubble. Then came the decimate stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty where the donor was not manually prepared, but by prepared using a microkeraton. Uh, and iBank started giving you pre-cut uh, prepared lenticules. And this is when the surgical technique really became popular worldwide. And currently, we perform uh, even more refined procedures like the decimates membrane endothelial keratoplasty or the ultra thin DSEC or the nano thin DSEC. The advantage of DMEC in the paper that Melis published in 2009, he showed that almost 75% of the cases reached 2025 or better within one to three months. So, this was the biggest advantage of a DMEC surgery. And if we look at the trend of DMEC, you will find that. Uh, more and more people are switching over to DMEC from performing other endothelial keratoplasty procedures like DSEC or DSEC. And in 2018, there was a, almost a 5.4% decrease in the number of penetrating keratoplasty. And correspondingly, the DMEC numbers increased by 4.6%. The DMEC is minimally invasive. You can do the surgery through a 2.2 to 3 millimeter incision. Don't really require very expensive instrumentation for the surgery. Uh, there's faster visual recovery. There's a, because the anatomy of the cornea is maintained, you see a minimal refractive shift. And since you're transplanting only the isolated decimates membrane, the risk of rejection is the lowest among all the other corneal transplantation surgical procedure. And theoretically, it's possible to utilize the same donor tissue after stripping the decimates membrane, using it for DMAC surgery. The rest of the tissue can also be used for anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Now, sometimes I get people who ask me, is it necessary to learn DSEC or DSEC first before proceeding with DMEC? Well, a valid point. Uh, I think you can correlate the same question is, is it necessary to learn extra capsular cataract surgery or a small incision cataract surgery before you learn FACO? As you know, there are a lot of people who straight away start with FACO and they find it very difficult to perform an extra capsular cataract surgery. Same thing with DMEC. There are surgeons who have never performed a DSEC 
surgery and they have started straight away with the med. But there are certain scenarios where the corneal visibility may not be great and you may have to fall back on doing uh, the DSEC procedure or ultra thin DSEC. Looking at the DMEC technique, donor preparation. Uh, in the United States, most of the eye banks give you pre stripped or pre loaded DMEC uh, uh, donor tissue. Whereas in India, our eye banks give us the whole cornea. So we have to prepare our own uh, donor uh, decimates rolls, which means that means we have to strip our own donor tissue. Now, the donor preparation has a very uh, short learning curve. It's fairly reproducible. And the risk of damaging the donor tissue is less than one to 2%. And even if you do damage the tissue, uh, you, you can still manage to utilize the damaged uh, decimates membrane in about 80% of the cases. And in the worst possible scenario, if you do damage the decimates membrane, you can still use the donor cornea for an anterior lamellar keratoplasty. If you look at what is the ideal donor age, the ideal donor age for a DMEC would be somewhere between the age of 55 to 75 years. If you take a younger donor tissue and you manage to strip the decimates, you will find that it will have a greater tendency to scroll. Uh, in, in somewhere between 20 to 30 years of age, it will become almost like a tight scroll as you see on the top right. And as progressively uh, in older eyes, you will find that the tissue tendency to scroll becomes progressively less. However, beyond the age of 80, 80 85 years, you will find that sometimes the decimates after stripping does not uh, scroll much, which can again be a difficult, uh, which can give rise to some difficulty identifying which is the correct orientation intraoperatively. These are a few instruments that I developed with a company from Italy from, called JANAC. Uh, uh, DMEC stripping forceps or the cleavage hook, which you will see in the next video. So to prepare the tissue, we take the donor cornea square rim and a 10 millimeter trifine. This trifine has a 100 micron blade. So it's a guarded depth trifine, which means uh, it'll cut only 100 microns. After doing this partial punch, you use uh, a trifine blue staining to stain the cut edge. And then using the DMEC hook, we try to free the edge uh, of the decimates at the site of partial thickness trifination. This is important we, so that you don't have any areas of adherence in the periphery. So once you have freed the decimates membrane all around, you can then proceed with stripping the decimates. The forceps, it has a wider area to grip the decimates. So you have uh, a more uh, generalized distribution of the pressure. So the risk of tearing the decimates is less. After doing a 60 to 70% partial peel, we prefer to stain it with tripan glue so that we have some idea of where the folded decimates is. And then using a dermatological punch, either a 2 mm or a 3 mm, you can create a stromal window. After you have punched the stromal tissue, you put back the stromal, uh, punched out stromal tissue back in position. Then you float the decimates membrane back into its original position using a no-touch technique. And then we flip the donor tissue over. You can now open the stromal window that you have created. You mark your stamp, the F stamp. If you don't have one of these F or the S stamp, you can even use a Sinsky hook and uh, write whatever asymmetric letters you would want. So you dry the decimates, the stromal side of the decimates, and then put the ink mark. Here I'm using an F stamp. F stands for fun. And once you have done that, then you can go back with a eight millimeter or 8.5 millimeter punch and do a partial punch. You don't do a through and through punch. You put some BSS and you can see that the peripheral rim of DM is free. You can remove that. And here you can see which part of the decimates partial peel has been done with the stain. And then you can hold one edge and you can complete the peel so that the entire decimates scroll is free. So this completes your preparation of the decimates scroll.
And you can see that the decimal tends to go back into its natural scroll formation where the endothelial side is on the outside and the, the stromal side is in the inside. So you put in some tripan glue. Staining duration can be somewhere anywhere between one to three minutes. I usually use it for 60 to 90 seconds, but some people prefer to have a much darker stain. They use it for two to three minutes as well. And you can see that that's a nicely stained donor tissue. You can load it into the injector from the donor cornea scleral rim itself, but have your nurse keep placing some additional BSS. Otherwise you run out of BSS even before the tissue has gone into the cartridge. The other way to do it is if you don't have access to one of these 10 millimeter trifine, you can use a conventional trifine to do a partial punch, but it's difficult to control. And if you do a deeper uh, trifination, sometimes identifying the edge is a little difficult. Or if you have a tissue which is slightly younger, let's say a 45 or 50 year old, the getting the edge to become free can also become a bit challenging if you have done a slightly deeper trifination. So how can you overcome that? So this is another technique which was described by Frederick Cruz. And you can see that there is a small area of DM loss which is already there from the eye bank, which is stained by the tripan glue. So it's important that even before you use your tissue, you can always stain with tripe and glue to identify if there are any pre-existing areas of tissue loss. So here, instead of using a trifine, I'm using a, a 15 degree slit knife. And I'm not going to cut the tissue, but I'm using the tip as uh, to scrape the stroma. So I'm basically breaking the decimate using the pointed tip, and I'm just scraping it keeping my instrument vertical, the blade vertical. So basically you're trying only to create a break in the decimates, but this is a break which is uh, like a blunt break. You're not trying to use a sharp edge to cut it. So you do that circumferentially. You can even mark your starting point on the sclera with a marking pen so that once you have completed 360 degree, you know that uh, you have gone around all the way around. The disadvantage of using this technique is that sometimes you can get uncontrolled tears in the decimates in the periphery. So after completing that peripheral scraping, we again use stripe and glue to stain. So you can stain it for about 30 to 40 seconds. Make sure that the dye goes all the way to the periphery, the area where you've broken it. Then you can wash your wash the tripan glue dye off, and you bring back. And now you can see the broken edge of the decimates. You put in some BSS, and now you can take the hook or a sinski, and you can first, if there are any peripheral tags, you can remove them using a tying forceps. Especially if there are tiny radial tears, you kind of round them off by pinching off the decimate so that these radial tears don't extend uh, centrally. So you can see that that's what I'm doing. So now what, what I, I'm going to do after we finish uh, completing this is, again, you have to make sure that you have to free the peripheral edge of the decimates. So you can do that with a fine tying forceps as well, or you can use a, 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 a specific DMEC hook, which has a pointed tip round bodied structure, or you can use a Sinski as well. And you can see that I'm trying to get that edge to become free. Unlike a trifination, which has a nice controlled circular, here you can find that the edge does not have a very regular shape. At times, you may find some uh, areas where the separation becomes very difficult. If if it if it's very difficult to separate, then you can go counterclockwise and try to approach. The, the separation from the opposite side. 
And even if you don't achieve the separation 360 degrees, even if you have it for 270 degrees, that's sufficient. You can keep the area where it is still attached as to, to act like the area of the hinge. That means you go opposite, directly opposite to the area of the attachment and start peeling from there. So the peel happens towards the area where the decimates is still uh, tightly adherent and you're unable to free that. So here I'm using again a curved forceps. I'm trying to use the broad end to hold a larger area and gradually using uh, you know, a, a single motion. So you don't try to uh, pull the tissue uh, too hard and keep an eye on the area of the separation. It should remain like a straight line. If you start seeing that the, the separation is not happening uniformly between the center and the periphery, that means that periphery, there may be some areas of attachment which you have to go and then uh, free up before you continue with your uh, separation of the decimals. So again, after doing a 60-70% uh, peel, we stain and rest of the steps are the same as what I showed you in the previous video. We do the 2mm punch, we make the staining and then we go back do an eight millimeter punch. And after you've done the eight millimeter punch is a peripheral rim of irregular tissue that's there. You can just remove that. And you can then peel the tissue and stain it with tripe and glue for about one to two minutes. Here you can see that when you're absorbing your uh, tripe and glue, you use two marisol sponge so that the dye spread symmetrically in both directions. So your donor tissue, the donor DM doesn't rush towards the marosal sponge. If you were to use only one marosal sponge as the fluid rushes toward the marosal sponge, so will the donor DM, so it can get stuck to your uh, marosal sponge as well. So once you have done that, so in here you will see that I'm taking the entire tissue and I'm going to go back to my bowl, which is glass bowl, which is filled with BSS. And I float my decimate scroll into that fluid. I just dip my donor corneal spiral rim. And now to load this, instead of loading it from the front, as you saw in the previous video, here the loading will happen from the posterior uh, end of a glass cartridge, which is wider. So here, uh, this is an older donor tissue. You can see that it's not directly going into a, the actual scroll configuration. So I have to just put a little bit of fluid to make it uh, get into the right, uh, configuration before I load it onto the injector. So you can see that's the glass injector. We are loading it from the posterior end of the wider end of the glass injector cartridge. Besides doing the F or the S stamp, the other way to identify the orientation is that from the endothelial side, we can make a triangular, sorry, it's there's some drawing that's happening, which I have not made, but yeah. So you have this triangular notch that can be created in the periphery of the donor tissue. The triangular notch from the endothelial side points counterclockwise. And when you transplant the donor DM into the eye, this triangular notch, as you see in the uh, in, in, in the surgical video image, you can see that the notch is, the arrowhead of the notch is going clockwise. So it's a way of identifying that you have the donor tissue in the right orientation. Problem with this is, this is very nice if you have a light colored iris, but if you have a dark brown colored iris, sometimes the peripheral notch is not seen very well. And especially if the patient has a very dense arcus, it might be difficult to see this peripheral edge. But against a completely air fill, if you try to flatten the cornea, you can see the peripheral uh, notch. Uh, it, it enhances the appearance of the peripheral notch. Other way to do is to do this asymmetric peripheral marking. You can create these two marks in the periphery. Uh, uh, they call them Roman numerals, or you can asymmetric marks, a single mark and, and uh, another two marks. Uh, from the endothelial side, the, the junction between the first and second is counterclockwise and once it is transplanted inside the eye, you will find that the, the orientation between the one and the two, it goes clockwise. So that again, to show you that you have the donor tissue in the right orientation. The 
iBank can give you pre-stripped donor tissue where they have done a partial peel of the decimate membrane. So they do the, uh, the peel of the donor tissue, which is 70 to 80 percent, punch it out to the, uh, so they don't punch it out. The final punch is not done by them. So this is a large 9.5, 10 millimeter peel they have done, but they peel it for 70 to 75 percent. They usually mark, mark the notch, the, the, the attached edge or the hinge by a peripheral notch in the sclera or a peripheral ink mark. So you know where the hinge is. And then you can use your desired size, 7.25 to 8 millimeter. And then you can, uh, after you punch it out, you can complete the rest of the peel. So this is how, this, this is a tissue, pre-stripped tissue from the eye bank. You can see the S mark there, which from the endothelial side, it looks like a reverse S because the mark is from the stromal side. You see a dense peripheral blue mark. So that tells me where the hinge is. That means they have separated, but that's on the, the mark where the hinge is, that is where the decimates is still attached. I do my eight millimeter punch. And after doing this punch, uh, you're putting in some ESS to protect the endothelium. Remove the peripheral rim and then but you can see the difference here because here, unlike in my cases, after doing the 60, 70% peel, I stain with the tripe and glue. So I can see which is the part which is already stripped and which is unstripped. But here, because they have not stained it, it can sometimes become a bit tricky to be able to visualize the decimates membrane. So we, but the hinge tells me that I know that opposite to the hinge is where it's free and I can see the S mark. So once I have done that, I, I've freed up the edge, which is already, uh, pre strip I will then go ahead and I will peel the donor DM by holding it at one edge. And I complete it. So that's how you will, when you have a pre strip tissue. Nowadays, you get patient ready DMEC donor tissues where the eye bank has already stripped the donor tissue, it has stamped it, it has stained it with tripe and blue and it has loaded it into a injector, either so this is a modified Jones tube, they can do it in the endoglide or the glass injector and the eye bank can provide you with the glass injector which is stabilized within the storage solution. So that completes the part on the donor preparation. I can go ahead with the surgical technique. If you want me to take questions right at the end, we can do that. Or if you feel that there are questions on donor preparation at this point of time, uh, we can do some discussion and then I can proceed for the surgical steps. I think it's okay, so go ahead with the next step. Sure, sure. So the next step is stripping the decimates from the host cornea. This is pretty much the same as what you do in your DSEC surgery. So usually uh, most of the corneas that we see do have an edematous epithelium. So we like to do epithelial debridement in most of the cases of DMAC that I perform. And then I like to create uh, eight, eight mm because I strip slightly larger than eight mm, I like to create an impression of eight mm on the surface. So I know where exactly I need to strip. The general consensus now is that you strip larger than the size of the donor, which means that if you're putting in an eight millimeter donor, maybe you will strip uh, about a nine millimeter from the host cornea. Uh, they, have they have done comparative studies of understripping versus overstripping, and they have found that the graft detachment rate and the incidence of rebubbling are lower when you do a larger stripping than the size of the donor. So basically, the donor DM strips, uh, sticks better to a bare stroma as opposed to uh, on the, the host decimus membrane. So in terms of uh, we make that eight millimeter mark, you can put in a few dots and then um, using a, this is again a reverse Sinsky uh, that I designed, which has a ball tip. The ball tip ensures that even if you apply more pressure, you don't break the stroma and uh, engage stromal fibers. So I like to do it under viscoelastic cover. I fill the anterior chamber with cohesive viscoelastic that helps maintain the chamber very well while you do the stripping process. The other option is to do it under air. 
you will see that uh, you can make a slightly longer paracentesis, put in and make sure that your speculum is not very tight. So you don't, you want to minimize the counter pressure, release as much as aqueous as possible so that the air bubble retains much better. Then again, go with your reverse sense key, break the decimates. The advantage with air is that you get the maximum contrast uh, as compared to when you're doing it under viscoelastic. So this is also a great technique, uh, but the problem is sometimes the air keeps leaking out you can connect an AC maintainer and you can, which is connected to a syringe filled with air and your assistant can keep uh, re-injecting air when the air leaks out, or you can attach it to an air pump so that the chamber remains uh, filled with air while you're doing this procedure. This is very useful if you have a econia, which is quite edematous and your visibility is not too great. So that's the stripping hook that I designed, which has a ball tip, which is quite useful. It's available from stores. Now the next step, important step after we have done the decimate stripping is we put in some myocol to constrict the pupil. And then I like to do an infi API. The infi API is basically, so we use an extended air fill when you're doing DMAC. So to prevent the pupillary block, you want to do an infi API. So the infi API can be done preoperatively with the YAG laser. If your corneal clarity allows that to be performed, or you can do it intraoperatively, either using a vitrector, or you can do it through an inferior paracentesis. If I'm operating on a fakic eye, I like to do surgically via an inferior uh, paracentesis. I pull the iris out and I do. But otherwise, the vitrector is a good choice. The settings on the vitrector, you put your vitrector in the, usually we use it in the cut IA mode, but for this step, you can change it to IA cut mode. So it will aspirate first and then it will cut. The cutting rate can be as low as 100 to 150. And the vacuum, you can keep it about 200 to 250. And you can make sure that you mark your six o'clock position outside. We're looking outside the microscope at six o'clock, actual six o'clock, make a mark on the limbus and then go with your vitrectomy probe. Because sometimes depending on which position you're sitting, what you assume to be the six o'clock position while seeing through the oculus may not exactly be six o'clock. So you don't want to make a PI and then realize that it's not exactly at the most inferior dependent position. And if your pupil is not really constricted, when you make a PI, what seems like an inferior PI would be something like a mid peripheral PI. And also when you're doing the PI, after you've made the PI, always uh, irrigate the anterior chamber and you can pass a cannula below the iris through the pupil, and you should be able to visualize the cannula through your, uh, the inferior PI that you have made. That ensures that the PI is a complete PI and not an inferior PI. Don't overdo with the vitrector because if you do overdo with the vitrector, what will happen is it will cut the iris tissue. Then if you persist, you will cut the zonules and you will also cut the vitreous. And basically you will make it like a unicameral eye where your anterior chamber is then communicating with the vitreous cavity and sometimes when you inject too much fluid, you, you can have the fluid going into the vitreous cavity and the whole lens iris diaphragm coming back, coming up forward. So let, let me just show you, this is the step that I perform uh, with the vitrector, just a few. I, I like filling the chamber with viscoelastic and then I can just go and do these few cuts, which, uh, so I don't have to keep my infusion in the anterior chamber uh, or you can do it uh, surgically. You can use a micro forceps to pull out the inferior peripheral iris, make a vertical PI, don't make a shelving PI. If you make a shelving PI, sometimes it's difficult to reach the peripheral part of the iris. So I go with my knife and I make a straightaway vertical paracentesis, just going vertically down. And that allows me to easy access to the peripheral iris to pull it up and be careful when you pull the iris up because if you apply too much of force and you use a bigger force, sometimes you can end up creating an aerator dialysis as well if you're not very careful. In terms of insertion and unfolding. So the incision that I make is usually a clear corneal incision. Uh, it can vary from 2.8 to three millimeter, depending on what cartridge you are using to uh, inject the uh, donor tissue into the eye. So you can have this, this is a glass injector from Goida, or you can use the 
Jones tube, modified Jones tube, or you can use the endoglide, or you can, can even use some of the. Sorry. Yes, can, please. What kind of cartridge do you prefer? Because here it's very popular a cartridge from Alcon, but I prefer the Goither glass inserter. Yes, I have used all of them, and I think all of them work very well. But the, having the Goither glass injector, I think it's uh, relatively makes the process relatively easier and more controlled because you load the tissue from the wider posterior end and you have enough space within the injector to be able to visualize the donor and somehow the uh, insertion into the eye may be a little bit more controlled. But at the same time, in terms of IOL cartridge, I like using the AMO sensor cartridge. The three-piece sensor cartridge I will show later on in the video, but you can almost modify uh, any of the cartridges because the basic principle remains the same. It's just that sometimes if you're not, the, the junction between the cartridge and your syringe has to be tight. If that is leaky, you will have difficulty. And if your uh, the syringe is tacky, it's not moving freely. Sometimes you can end up aspirating the decimates into the barrel of the syringe as well. So I think uh, it's important, whichever technique you use, you should practice that in the wet lab. To practice, you can use the, uh, when you do the capsular axis, the anterior capsule that you remove, you can, the circular capsule that you remove, you can remove it from the eye, stain it with tripen blue, float it in fluid, and then you can practice trying to load that. So this is something that you can do in the wet lab and it can help you practice uh, the technique of loading and uh, inserting, trying to insert this into the eye. Great, we got it. Sure. So now, you to, as I mentioned, to load, you can load directly from the corneal scleral rim. So you don't take the tissue and again, float it in the, uh, the Petri dish with the BSS. The, the difference is that sometimes when you're trying to aspirate from the corneal scleral rim, the tissue may not go inside the tip of the cartridge and you run out of BSS that is there within the corneal scleral rim. So the important step here is that you instruct your nurse to gradually keep replenishing the corneal scleral rim with BSS while you're trying to load. And you should have some control when you're trying to aspirate. You should not apply too much pressure, otherwise the, the DM scroll can come inside the syringe itself. So there you can see that we are using the bevel keeping up and we gently try to nudge the scroll into the tip of the cartridge. And always make sure once you have loaded it into the cartridge and you you, you keep the tip slightly facing upward and don't keep it down because sometimes if the fluid, there's some leak, the fluid can, the, the tissue can, you can lose the tissue. Loading it from the posterior side, it's uh, basically in the goiter, you attach a small silicon tubing at the tip and it's attached to a syringe. Once you've loaded it, you attach another syringe to the posterior end as well. So it's closed from both sides. So by the time you go back to the patient's eye, and you're going to inject the tissue, the tissue is protected from both, both ends and it, it prevents it from uh, running out anywhere. In DSEC, we are used to pulling in a donor tissue. You can see that you use the bucin glide or the endo, uh, endo glide to pull in the, the donor tissue into the eye. So you have some control, there is some volume to the tissue. Once you have the scroll into the eye, you inject an air bubble and you're, but in, DMAC, you are basically not touching the tissue. It's like a no touch technique. So you are flushing the tissue into the eye. As you see in this video, we are flushing the tissue, the stained DM scroll into the eye. And so there are some points that I will discuss as I show you this video again. You close the wound and you basically using a no touch technique, you are tapping the surface and by Tapping the surface, you are creating fluid shock waves within the anterior chamber, and then you get your scroll to open up. And once it's opened up and it's in the desired position, you go ahead and you place the air bubble below the scroll. So when, so when you look at the scroll, the open end of the scroll should be facing towards the surgeon. So that's the right orientation. If you have the open end of the scroll facing downwards towards the iris, that means you have the scroll in the wrong orientation. 
So if the scroll is facing upwards, the endothelium is facing down. If the scroll is, the open end of the scroll is facing down, then you have the endothelial surface facing up towards the stroma. So when you load the tissue into the injector, and when we are injecting it into the eye, we try to, we look at the tip and you can see this V pattern which you're seeing. And you can see that if your V is in the right, if the open end of the scroll is towards you, this V, the central part, the V will be lighter in color. Whereas if it's the other way around, you won't see that difference very well. So you try to see under the microscope, see under high magnification and make sure that the open end of the scroll is facing towards you so that even if you enter inside the eye, bevel down, once your tip is inside the eye, you will rotate the syringe, you will rotate the cartridge in a way that this becomes superior. That means this starts facing you. So you are trying to get your inject the scroll into the eye so that the open end of the scroll is facing towards you. So here you can see that, and don't do a wound assisted delivery. The tip of the cartridge should always be inside the eye. So you make sure that your tip goes fairly inside the eye and you can see I'm trying to get the open end of the scroll. Uh, this is a slightly tighter scroll, so it's not uh, perfectly visible. It's still, so, and don't be in a hurry to remove the tip. You can wait, now you can see that I waited till my chamber has shallowed a little bit, the tip has opened up and then you remove it and you also press the lip of the wound to ensure that the lip closes very well, place a suture, even if you have a, a self-sealing wound of 2.8 or 3, always suture the wound because if you don't suture the wound, sometimes your donor tissue can jump out of the eye when you are doing these tapping maneuvers. And you can see that we did a few tapping maneuvers. We can see the S mark, which tells us that it's in the right orientation. It's within the central mark that we have made on the surface. And then you do a complete air fill and you're pretty much done with the surgery. Now let's look at, so this is, I'll again show you. So here we have, we have injected the tissue within the eye. The tissue looks something like a taco. You can see that it's, it's not exactly in a perfect double scroll configuration. It's gone in and it's something like a taco. So what do we do? We will do some peripheral tapping. So you can see that when you, we, first of all, we inject a little bit of fluid. So the fluid injection was to get the tissue to, to for the scroll to uh, rotate a little bit. So we basically from the taco, we tried to get it into a scroll configuration so that the open end of the scroll is facing towards me. And you can see that I'm using this two cannulas to tap. I'm moving, moving the tissue to the periphery. Once it's in the periphery, I gradually remove my, so I know that's in the right. So I will use one cannula, the tip, to pin down one end. And once it's pinned down, I'm using the other end to tap in the periphery. As I tap and I quickly release it, when you release the cannula, the rebound causes the fluid to come back. And along with it, you will find that the scroll also opens up. Sometimes releasing fluid from the paracentesis, if it is located in that quadrant, can also have a same effect because as the fluid you release from the paracentesis, as the fluid rushes out, the scroll will also open up but make sure that the opposite end, you try to pin it down using one, uh, one edge of the cannula. So you can, and here you see what, what you see in this video, the mistake that I made, sorry, I think I'll go back to this video and I will try to show you is that I came at this point and I opened it up the scroll and then I injected, I went under the cannula, uh, I went under the, so you can see that I'm going with a 27 gauge cannula or a 30 gauge cannula. I'm placing the tip under. So when it is under, the tip will become blue. You can see that the cannula tip has become blue, which indicates that my cannula is positioned below the DM donor. If it is above, you will not see this uh, cannula turning blue. So I went, I came to the center. Don't inject from the periphery. If I started injecting from here, the air bubble will move the entire donor tissue to the periphery, to the opposite end. So always come to the center and then you try to inject your air bubble. So, and always inject a small air bubble first so that in case there is some movement of the donor tissue, you can always come back and uh, tap the tissue to move it to the desired position. So I, I, I came in, I got a bubble and then I wanted to enlarge the bubble. So I came from the other side and you can see I'm injecting another air bubble 
but this bubble is not joining with the first one. So in the interface, it has caught my donor tissue and my donor tissue is getting folded. So if you see here, you don't see the donor tissue here. You can see this on the opposite side is blue, but here in the bubble, the tissue is, this is clear. There is no bluish appearance. So what has happened is this bubble has displaced the DM scroll. So what do you do? You aspirate this bubble back out. So I could see that, that my tissue is folded between the two bubbles. So I, I saw that and then I went in and I aspirated my bubble. Once I aspirate the bubble, the first bubble is opening up the scroll again and my DM is back in position. And then you can go back, try to go inside the first bubble and then inject the air to uh, open up the scroll or complete the air film. It's important to have, it's Can important to have, yes, please. Excuse me. Would you prefer air bubble or gas? Yes. If I would recommend 20% SF6 for people starting out with demand, because studies have shown that the incidence of rebubbling is lower because you get an extended tamponade with 20% SF6. Uh, and the disadvantage of 20% SF6 is that if you have a pseudophagic bullous keratopathy and you don't know what kind of IOL has been implanted previously, if it's a hydrophilic IOL, if you use extended gas tamponade, you can get central opacification in the intraocular lens. And the second problem is that if you use myotic to constrict the pupil and then use 20% SF6 gas, and because the gas tamponade lasts longer, sometimes that you can get, there is increased incidence of posterior synechia forming as well. So when I see my patient on day one post-op, I usually try to add a, a kind of a, a dilating drop twice a day for the first three, four days to ensure that my pupil remains mobile, something like tropicamide, and that can ensure that I don't develop, uh, my patient does not develop posterior synechia. Perfect. And there is another question in the OR, yes. in the operating room, the yes. air bubble for how long? 20 no, minutes? In, in, I, I, because I have an inferior PI, yeah. I don't remove the air. I do a complete air fill and it's end of surgery. My patient goes out. Uh, he doesn't have to maintain a supine position. Uh, if, if it's unlike, if the, the only indication for a supine position in DMAC would be a vitrectomized eye with a PI where the air can go into the posterior chamber. Or if I have a patient with previous trap or tube or any like a post-fail penetrating keratoplasty graft where I want the tamponade to be there for a longer duration of time, maybe that is the only indication where I will try to have the maintain, patient maintain a supine position. Otherwise, in a normal uh, patient where the lens iris diaphragm is intact, because you do a complete air fill, uh, there is no, the patient can be in any position, it doesn't matter. And so we, unlike a DSEC where you do a tight air fill and you go back after 10, 15 minutes and release some air and you leave behind an 80 or 90% fill. In DMAC, we do a complete fill, but we don't do a tight fill. We don't try to increase the pressure to 35, 40 millimeters of mercury for 10 minutes. We don't do that. So, how the other precaution that you need to take in DMAC is how not to overfill the anterior chamber is that you put in a like an 80% air fill and then you go and inject some VSS to normalize the pressure first. Perfect. And once the IOP is normal, then you go back again with your air or gas and you enlarge that 80% air fill to something like a complete fill, but the pressure in the eye should be in the range of about 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury. So it shouldn't be too firm. So you do a complete fill, but you don't do a firm fill because that decimates membrane is, doesn't have volume. It's not like a DSEC tissue, which is thicker. In DSEC, sometimes we want to do that tight air fill because we want to remove all that fluid from the interface because the DMAC tissue is thicker. Sometimes it doesn't conform to the curvature of the host cornea. So in the center part, you have this little bit of cleft. So by doing a tight air fill, you're trying to get that cleft fluid in the cleft coming out and then you wait for 10, 15 minutes and you decrease the pressure. Whereas in DMAC, if you look at, if you have intra-op OCT, you will find that 
the moment you do a complete air fill on the intraop OCT, you will find the interface is, there is no interface. You can't even see the decimus membrane. So there is no need to pressurize and uh, the, the decimus scroll, even with a normal air fill, the air bubble, it, it supports the decimus pretty well. Okay, perfect, thanks. Now look at uh, another maneuver. So here we are. So just let me uh, try and explain. You might be wondering that I have an AC maintainer running there. So uh, AC maintainer is basically kept to keep the anterior chamber well formed. Uh, however, in this video, the AC maintainer is playing a different role. I That's a 25 gauge AC maintainer. I like connecting an AC maintainer uh, before I inject my, before I insert the tip of the cartridge into the eye. Uh, so the AC maintainer keeps the chamber very well formed. And as I am injecting the tip of the cartridge into the eye, I don't encounter uh, loss of fluid and the chamber becoming shallow and the iris catching my tip of the cartridge. So I have enough space so I can inject my tip of the cartridge very well. And you can see that sometimes I will put my tip of the cartridge even beyond the pupil. So I ensure that my tissue delivery is beyond the pupillary margin. Otherwise, uh, when you're trying to inject your uh, donor scroll into the eye, and if your chamber is shallow at that point of time, uh, and if your pupil is kind of slightly mid dilated, your donor tissue sometimes can try to go between the iris and the lens. So you find that your tissue kind of gets stuck there instead of going to the inferior quadrant. So the AC maintainer keeps the chamber form and I get my tip of the cartridge into the eye. Once my tip is in the desired position, I ask my nurse to switch off the AC maintainer. Not only does she switch off, she also disconnects the, the AC maintainer tubing from the IV line. So when I do this step, basically the AC maintainer is now a port for the fluid to go out of the eye. So when I inject, when I'm trying to flush my donor DM into the eye, the flow is unidirectional. At times what happens is when you're flushing the tissue into the eye, the fluid goes into the eye, it forms the chamber. There is no space for the fluid to now go out. The chamber is very well formed, but your donor tissue has still not gone completely into the anterior chamber. And then if you try to pressurize further to inject the donor DM, what happens is you will find that because now the fluid, the excess pressure fluid is leaking out from the main incision, from the sides of your cartridge, you will find that the tissue goes into the eye and then it tries to come back and try to escape from the main incision. Or if you have a leaky side port, the tissue rushes, rushes to the side port and it tries to go out because that's where the fluid is, tissue will follow the fluid. So here, because I have an AC maintainer which is disconnected, the fluid is going out through the AC maintainer out of the anterior chamber. So my chamber, the anterior chamber pressure is never raised. So when you will see in this video that when I'm injecting my donor tissue, my donor tissue goes into the eye in a very controlled manner. And once the inferior edge of the DM reaches the uh, inferior AC and I wait for some time, my chamber shallows, the inferior iris actually catches the decimus membrane. So it ensures that my scroll will not tumble over onto the opposite uh, orientation. And also when I'm withdrawing my tip of the cartridge, the tissue doesn't rush out of the eye because sometimes when you, well, without this AC maintainer connected, which is disconnected, if you inject the tissue, you may have gone inside with the tissue, but now your chamber is very pressurized with the donor tissue. As you are trying to remove the tip of the cartridge, you find that the tissue tries to rush out of the eye. And often the tissue is partially out of the eye or caught in the main wound. I hope I'm clear with this, but just, uh, sorry, you can watch this. You will find that my tip of the cartridge is inside and I'm watching the open end of the scroll and you can see that I'm going in very slowly in a controlled manner and the inferior tip has, the, the inferior edge has reached the uh, inferior AC. I'm just waiting for some time. I'm catching the wound. I'm trying to disengage the cartridge from the wound and I'm just giving a little bit of flushing and you can see I didn't have to press the lip of the wound and my tissue is, is maintained in the right orientation, the open end of the scroll facing towards me. I suture the wound, I further shallow the chamber a little bit, and now you can see that I have a tissue that's already partially open. I'm first moving the tissue uh, towards the, 
towards one side. I don't know whether it's nasal or temporal because I don't know which eye it is. So if you are trying to move it towards one edge, and then I'm using one cannula to pin down the open, the scroll part of the scroll, which is open. And then I'm using this dear summer maneuver where I'm playing samba on the cornea. I'm playing drums with my second cannula. And I can, you can see that I've just opened it up. And I can see the F stamp there, which tells me that the orientation, which reconfirms that I'm in the right orientation. And by tapping in the periphery, so here to move the donor tissue, you don't sweep the cornea like what you do with the dissect tissue. You can just go to the periphery. And as you tap, tap the peripheral cornea outside the donor scroll, you have to put a little bit of fluid to push the iris back. And you can see, you can just tap the peripheral cornea. And if you, yeah, using the tip of your cannula, you can get the tissue to move. So now it's pretty much in the desired position. And you can go in and you can put an air bubble. It's important when you try to put in an air bubble, even a shallow chamber, be very careful. Sometimes your iris, your cannula will engage the iris. And if you don't pay attention, you'll end up creating an iridodialysis. So here you can see the cannula turns blue. I go to the center and I inject air. Always inject a mid-size air bubble, normalize the pressure, confirm the orientation. Come back to your wound. I don't cut the suture in the beginning because if I find that my suture in the wound is too tight, I can always revise the suture and make sure that I don't leave behind a very compressed primary wound uh, suture that I have. Now, looking at this, so this is my lucky day where I have a light colored iris. Uh, so this was an American lady with Fuchs. So we did a fake or will demax. So here again, you can see that I was trying to follow the orientation, trying to get the open the, the scroll into the eye. And I was using a scleral incision in this instead of a clear corneal. I've done scleral incision, sutureless as well. Now here, when I have done that, I realized that the scroll is in the reverse orientation. So it's the open end of the scroll is not facing towards me. Uh, so I have to then flip it over. So to flip it over, I orient it 90 degrees to the paracentesis that I have. And then I use a flow of fluid. This flow of fluid is directed towards the iris. In slow motion, if you see, I injected air, it rolled once, but then again, the flow continued and the tissue rolled back again. So I go with the second time, give it a small flow. And then you can see this time in a slow motion, it's again in there. So let me just try and play it again. I will stop this video and try to explain. So we had the tissue in the, so here we have this tissue in the reverse orientation. That means the open end of the scroll is facing towards the iris. So we tap the surface and we got this edge. We first ensure that the tissue is in a scroll configuration. And this edge of the scroll is 90 degrees to the paracentesis. Then you go in with your cannula, but the tip of the cannula is not directed towards the scroll. The tip of the cannula is directed toward the iris and you give very short bursts of fluid. So when you give short bursts of fluid, you're trying to create a current within the anterior chamber. So the fluid is going across the iris and it is coming across the cornea. So in this circular motion, when it is coming, it will cause this scroll to flip over. And you can see that if you apply too much of pressure, it can happen very quickly, is that you, you, you get something like this, you think that you have flipped the scroll, but you have not, you have actually double flipped it. So when you play in slow motion, you will see that we inject fluid, we get, get this first flip, and as the current continues, because we have injected too much fluid, it again goes into the same orientation what we had earlier. So I go back the second time. So before you inject fluid, you have to shallow the chamber a little bit because there has to be some space for you to be able to inject some fluid. So you can see here, I'm again injecting fluid. So this time I'm injecting a little slower and a lesser amount and I get this flip. And I'm, I've stopped before that, so my tissue remains at this orientation. In slow motion, once again, you will see that this is flipping over and it's, so now this, this is the open end of the scroll. If you see under the microscope, you will see the other way to figure out that this is the open end of the scroll is the Mozzori sign. Mozzori sign is basically, if I take this cannula into the anterior chamber and I put it inside this scroll, and if I move my cannula this side, it will come under the scroll and it will turn blue. But if, if it is the reverse way, 
you will not see that from happening because the entire thing will be blue. You won't see the change in the color of the candela. Here, the candela, once you put it here, it will be the same because there is nothing on top. But once you move the candela to the periphery, it will come against this fold of DM, which is there, and then the candela will turn blue. So that's the Motsuri sign whereby you can reconfirm that your candela is in the right orientation. So once you have this orientation, then you have to capture so that it doesn't move again. So then you have to release fluid from the anterior chamber to shallow the chamber. So you can, you press the center of the cornea and then you release fluid from the, so the center pressure is ensuring that your tissue does not move and you release fluid from the side port and that ensures that now you have space to tap the cornea and you can see the cornea is almost going in dimpling and you can gently tap and you can. So one cannula keeps the chamber shallow. So the fluid moves, giving you space on the other side to move. And once it's in the desired position, you can again shallow the chamber so that the tissue doesn't scroll up, tap the periphery, and you will find that you get the tissue to open up. Go in with your cannula, go below, make sure cannula turns blue, go to the center. And as you inject air, you will find that, and you can see the F stamp there. So this is how you can, you can unfold without too much of a problem. This is something that this, what you see this cartridge is basically a plastic micro pipette that I got from Amazon. It costs only about less than a dollar a piece and you can ETO sterilize them. Uh, the tip is closed so you can use a number 15 blade to create a bevel and that works very well. So let's play this video and you will find that I'm loading it from the posterior end. It's a younger donor, but it's going into a double scroll. So we load it into the injector and as I'm injecting it, you will find that uh, it's a slightly deeper chamber and it's not a great combination to have a myopic eye, a deeper chamber. So here to unfold, you can see that even though I'm shallowed the chamber, my scroll is not opening up. So I'm going to do the unfolding using air bubble as a third instrument. So I go in with my cannula. This, this syringe is attached basically to a tuberculin syringe. So you take a one ml syringe and you just have 0.1 ml air in it. And you take a 30 gauge cannula and you go within the scroll and you inject the air. So this, if you keep only 0.1 ml of air, it ensures that you will get a very small bubble. If you do that with your standard 3 cc or a 5 cc, you don't have control over how much of air you're injecting. And even though you try to inject a small air bubble, but because you are using a 27 or a 30 gauge cannula, the air gets compressed within the plunger of the syringe and you get more air that continues to release from the tip, even though you have stopped injecting air. So having a one ml tuberculin syringe is really helpful. And keeping that air bubble within the scroll and then shallowing the chamber, I'm using the air bubble as a third instrument to help me open up the scroll. So I can press the air bubble. So I'm basically now uh, got the air bubble. My tissue is kind of stuck a little superiorly towards the wound. I'm tapping to get it free. And I managed to get it free and then I'm moving it around so that I can get it into the desired position. And then I'm pinning down one side using the air bubble to open up the scroll. And this is a kind of a vitrectomized eye. So it's you, you don't have the posterior pressure or the up thrust. So finally, it takes a little longer to unfold in this situation. Once you have done that, gently go in and aspirate the air bubble, but aspirate it very slowly so the tissue does not go back into a scroll. You can see that my cornea is almost dimpling downwards. Then you go back with your candle below the scroll, always inject a small bubble. So for this also, you can use a tuberculin syringe, have only a small air uh, amount of air in it, create a small bubble first, so that tissue does not get displaced to one side or the other. And then you can go back and uh, enlarge the bubble. If you have leaky side ports, like in this case, it's important that you secure those leaky side ports with sutures as well. Otherwise, when you try to fill the chamber, you, if your air leaks out again, you will have insufficient air in the post-operative period. This is another case, a high myope. Again, I'm having a situation where my tissue is not opening up. So again, air bubble in the on top of the graft on the donor DM, and then you can use that air bubble as a third instrument to try and open up the scroll. Tap in the periphery, get the tissue in the desired position. And 
once it's opened up, then gently, don't be in a hurry to remove. You can leave that air bubble for some time and avoid getting the fish egg, the multiple bubbles, but sometimes you can't really help it. And then you can place the air and you can see your mark there, which looks pretty good. This is, uh, if you have a very tight scroll, like a younger donor, and this tight scroll does not open up, uh, besides using air, sometimes you can use this cannula. This is a cannula that I designed. It's closed at the tip, it has two side ports. So when you flush fluid, it goes inside, so that it creates lateral pressure and your, the tight scroll can open up and become like a, a double scroll. And then you can easily open it up using the techniques as we described earlier. You can move the tissue, always work with a, uh, a semi formed chamber. It should not be deep. It should not be completely flat. It should be partially formed so that the, you don't you 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 can control uh, some of the uh, uh, the the movements of the donor DM within the eye. And whenever you want to deepen any part of the chamber using the cannula in the left hand, you just press at the limbers. The fluid displaces to that part of the anterior. You can see here I'm releasing some fluid from the main port, and that helps open up the scroll as well. I can see my S stamp there and you can complete the surgery. This is another situation where again, you have a tight scroll. So you, I'm taking that cannula, you can see, I'm trying to tap, it's not opening. Uh, so I orient it. So you, your tissue scroll should be parallel to the port that you have. Go in with your cannula, which has the two side ports and then you insert it gently within the scroll, the cannula will turn blue. So you would go to the middle of the scroll, give it a short burst and you find that the scroll is opened up. And then you can release some fluid from the main incision. This opens up this edge of the scroll. Then you can tap in the periphery to move the graft to the center and place an air bubble and you're pretty much done. So it's not as complicated as it sounds, but uh, if you, uh, pay attention to some of these basic principles. It'll really make your life easier and you will be able to uh, do DMAC. Uh, pretty much you will say that it's the simplest surgery that you perform. It's important to use these. These are cannulas which I use are 27 or 30 gauge. They are uh, pretty long so they can reach up to the center center of the cornea, that means center of the anterior chamber pretty easily. So that's the same patient by day three, you can see that the patient is seeing 24. What about endo -in technique? This has again been popularized by Massimo Busin. We had uh, Donald Tan also popularized this as the, and uh, Dr. Murain from France also tries doing the endo -in technique. It's a little bit challenging though, let me show you. Uh, so if you, in the donor preparation here, we kind of tri-fold the tissue. That means when you are peeling off, you basically try to fold the tissue pretty much like a desect tissue. So you basically have endo in. So once you have done that, then you load this tissue into a cartridge. And let me go to the next slide and try to show you. It's moving too fast. Okay. So basically you have the tissue that's that's uh, I'm using a sensor cartridge into which I have uh, pulled in my trifolded tissue. And this is a, uh, the, you can use a Merosil sponge and you can put, use that to block the posterior part of the uh, cartridge, sensor cartridge. So it's basically like a popsicle. And then you can introduce the tip into the eye and going in with the forceps, the AC maintainer is running very slow to keep the chamber form. With the forceps, you catch the, edge of the donor DM. So here, when you are inserting, you are already inserting it in an orientation where the open end of the scroll here is down. So it's basically the reverse of what you do in a normal DMAC. So here we have trifolded, we have the endo in, so we want to go in in a way where, so the outer part is the stromal side. So you want to go in with the open end of the scroll facing down. So you pull the tissue into the eye, you remove your tip of the cartridge, but don't be in a hurry to let go. Because if you let go, because the AC maintainer is still running, your tissue can shoot out of the eye. So you ask your nurse either to further reduce the flow or you can stop the AC maintainer. And then you can tap the surface. Here I have, you remove the AC maintainer. I'm still holding on to the donor tissue. And then you can try and tap the tissue to kind of slightly unfold from the trifold that you have. If it is not unfolding, you can always go back 
and you can put a small air bubble within the scroll that you have. And then you can let go of your micro forceps that you have in your left hand. So you can see that we remove the micro forceps and then I'm tapping that air bubble and the donor tissue opens up. So the advantage is that this was a patient who had an AC IOL. So I did not want the Decimex scroll, what you do in a normal situation where the endothelium on the outside keep touching the uh, uh, AC IOL. So here with the endo in technique, I try to minimize the contact between the endothelium and the ant anterior chamber IOL. And then we do a complete air fill. And then we have our F stand to show that it's in the right orientation. And yeah, so that's the F stand that's there like that. So this was the endo in technique that we do. I don't do it very frequently, but if I'm faced with situations like uh, complicated surgery, especially sometimes in vitrectomized eye with limited working space due to a lot of peripheral anterior sinicae, eyes post trabeculectomy, post tubes, where the working space is very less. And I don't want to have a tissue that's in the reverse orientation because uh, with, the, with limited working space to try and flip over the donor tissue by, uh, by fluid waves sometimes can be very difficult. So in this scenario, using a pull through technique where I'm, I can ensure I have some control over how the tissue enters the eye seems to be quite useful. Or if I have a younger donor tissue also, sometimes I may want to use the pull through technique. But uh, recently, based on my experience, for those I have started moving on to doing ultra thin DSA. And this is a recent paper which has come out in this month, sorry. Uh, yeah, this month, the paper from uh, Donald Tan's group looking at the data on the pull through technique uh, I was not very impressed with the endothelial cell loss they have reported because originally when I personally spoke to Donald Tan, he told me the endothelial cell loss with the endo in, endo in technique was as low as eight to 10%. So I was mighty impressed. And my experience with the endo in technique has not been what, so my cell loss in these eyes have been variable depending on the amount of manipulation that I've done, but still on an average, it's in the range of about 30 to 40%. And even in this paper, if you see at six months, the, at 7.1 months on an average follow-up, the cell loss was 33.6%. But if you look at the range, it's from as low as 7.5. So it does work in certain eyes, but it can be as high as 80.4%. So that's pretty high. So I think the endo in technique, although in theory, it sounds pretty good, but sometimes the cell loss can be more because you manipulate a lot on the donor preparation when you're trying to try fold, loading it into the injector, pulling it and also, sometimes it opens up pretty well at times, depending on the flow of the anterior chamber and the currents within the uh, AC, you, the, the, the unfolding can be pretty challenging. Look at the orientation. Frank Price likes to use this handheld slit beam, handheld slit illuminating device, and he makes a very fine slit with that. And when you shine the slit on the eye, if you see those two, if you have the scroll in the right orientation, you will see the reflection from the two peaks of the folds that you have. So you will see these two parts of the scroll, which is illuminated. Whereas if you have it in the reverse orientation, because there is only one curvature, you will see a central single illumination. Uh, it sounds good. I have not tried it, but I, I, I'm, I, I don't know how useful it would be in our eyes. But what is definitely useful is that if you have this kind of intra-op OCT, quite an expensive device to have, but it can give you the orientation of your scroll. So if you had this, Maybe you don't even need to use the F or the F stamp. You can look at this cross section and you can, you can see here that we have got the scroll to open up and you can see once you put the air bubble, you can see there's hardly any interface. So that's why you don't need very high pressure to be maintained unlike what you do in these set eyes. Post-operatively, yes, I do a complete air fill. And when I see my patient an hour later on slit lamp, this is how it should be. There should be a very tiny meniscus of fluid inferiorly and that ensures that I'm not blocking my inferior PI uh, using uh, with, with this excess air itself. Because despite having an inferior PI, you can still create a pupillary block. If your PI is not exactly in the extreme periphery, but slightly uh, away from the periphery, and if you have injected air and your eye is still soft and you use air to firm up the eye, you overfill the anterior chamber with air, your lens eye is diaphragm really goes back. And then if you see the patient on slit lamp 
an hour later, you will still find that it's like a complete air fill. You can't see your inferior PI. In that scenario, your patient can still develop a bupillary block. Maybe you might need to burp out a little bit of the air on slit lamp so that you have this little bit of meniscus of fluid uh, inferiorly. And usually by day, day three, this is how it looks. Your air bubble, if you're using air, the air comes down to about 40% uh, fill. And by then, your cornea looks great. But again, uh, don't be very happy. I always follow up my patients at least for a week till the air bubble is completely gone because despite having a very well attached DM on day three or day four, I found at times when I see my patient at one week when the air bubble is completely gone, there can be separation of the DM, especially if the DM is from a younger donor. Maybe it's too elastic, so it requires the tamponade for a slightly longer period of time. So don't be in a hurry to send away your patient. At least at one week when your air is completely gone, you should be able to review your patient because that is the time you can always go back and do a rebubbling to ensure that the DM is well attached. Or if you're beginning out, you can always use 20% SF6, which has shown uh, that it's not toxic to the endothelium. It's quite safe. It, the endothelial cell counts are the same as what you see with air and also the lower incidence of graft detachment. The only thing is that if you use 20% SF6, watch out for opacification of hydrophilic IOLs. And also if you have used a myotic and your pupil is very small, you have increased incidence of posterior sinicale developing. What is the ideal case for a DIMA? Yes, you should have adequate visibility. You should be able to see your scroll. The anterior segment should be normal. They should not be like, you should not choose a vitrectomized eye with a large PI where you have communication with the posterior chamber or large iris defects with a lot of peripheral anterior sinicale. The lens iris barrier should be intact and don't take up eyes with abnormal anterior chamber like eyes with uh, post-glaucoma surgery, very high myopes or vitrectomized eye. At the same time, don't pick up pediatric eyes as well where the chamber tends to remain very shallow. But the working space is very limited. These are some of these cases, the indications that I use. Fuchs dystrophy is the best and you can combine it with cataract surgery or you can, uh, in the US now, the trend is that if you have a Fuchs dystrophy, they do the DMAC first. Uh, because although refractive shift after DMAC is less than what you see with DSEC, but it's not zero. It's, there is still some amount of refractive changes. It happens, depends on the extent of pre-op corneal edema that you have. And there can be some unpredictable astigmatism that you may see at two to four weeks, which goes away in about three months time once the edema has completely settled because the edema tends to clear from the center faster than the periphery. So, and, and then they go back and then give the option, the choice patient to have a toric or a multifocal lens. So they do it as sequential surgery. In our part of the world, patients don't like to pay twice for the surgery. So we tend to do the cataract surgery and the DMAC as a combined surgery. The other advantage of doing the cataract surgery and the DMAC as separate, where you do the cataract first and then come back and do a DMAC later is sometimes more favorable to our cataract surgeon because they don't lose out on the patient, on their patient with Fuchs. They love to do the cataract, the cornea decompensates, and then they say, go and take. The advantage in that scenario is that the, the capsular bag fibrosis. So unlike when you're doing a triple procedure, you do a capsular excess, put in your eye well, and then you are trying to put in your decimate scroll into the eye. Uh, sometimes you can have the the IOL edge popping out of the bag and you have to go back and push the IOL back into the bag because of the posterior upthrust. So always when you're doing a triple procedure, I like to make the rexis a little smaller to avoid this kind of IOL slipping out of the bag. And also if you do the cataract surgery first, in about one or two months time, the anterior and the posterior capsule fuses. And then you find that the lens iris diaphragm is more rigid than what you would have when you're doing a triple procedure. A uh, few uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy cases are ideal where you don't uh, have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, having a problem doing the cataract surgery through an edematous cornea. And just that, be careful when you do have a pseudophagic eye with edema, often it indicates that the primary surgeon may have had a complicated cataract surgery. So try and dilate the pupil uh, under retroillumination. Try to ensure that the posterior capsule is intact. 
try to see there is no peaking of the pupil, there was no vitreous in the anterior chamber. And always do a, before you prepare your DMAC tissue, try to put in a, a large air fill in the anterior chamber to ensure that the air remains in the anterior chamber. It can also help you identify any strands of vitreous or any posterior sinicae, peripheral sinicae that needs to be cleared. Outcomes of surgery, yes, you can see it's, it's a beautiful surgery. You see a pseudophagic bullous keratopathy with the edematous cornea. We go ahead, do a DMAX surgery, and you can see by the third or fourth day, if you look at the anterior segment OCT, the cornea is already looking normal. The speed of recovery is really good. So you can see this is a patient pre-op. This is one week, two weeks, and at one month, the cornea is already cleared again three days, five days, two weeks, and the cornea looks pretty clear. In fact, this is a, this is a case with Fuchs dystrophy. I did the first eye of the patient. In a week's time, she was almost 20, 30, and she was so happy, she wanted me to do the other eye. She was not willing to wait. So we said, why not? If the first eye is doing well, and it so happens that we had got a pair of tissues. So the first eye, we used one tissue, and the second eye, which was scheduled for another patient. The patient had medical problems, so the surgery was postponed. So we used the same, the, the second eye had the same donor uh, cornea tissue, what we used for the first eye, and we did that. And in, in, in one month's time, you can see both the corneas are seeing well. So this is a surgery where you can even do sequential surgery very close apart and achieve great results. This is the patient with the pull-through technique. You can see that's on day one where you can see, and you can two weeks, you can see the cornea is looking great. Had a good cell count of about 2,400, and she was seeing almost 2040 at two weeks, unaided. This is a patient who had a DSEC surgery, you can see, and the patient, the visual acuity would not improve beyond 660. The patient was very unhappy, so we looked at the anterior segment OCT. There's a lot of increased reflectivity from the interface, and we could see some retained decimates membrane as well. So we went back, we pulled out the DSEC graph from the eye, we cleaned the interface, removed all the DM remnants, and we did a DMAC. And now you can see post-op, you can see the reflectivity is much less, and the patient's uh, visual acuity, corrected visual acuity improved to 6, 12, 20, 40 at one month, and a cell count of about 2038. This is again another patient who had an AC IOL and a DSEC was done about two years back. Elsewhere, patient came back, now had a failed DSEC graph, so we went ahead, we removed the DSA graph, removed the AC IOL, did a secondary IOL using the Yamane technique. So you can see these two blue dots here uh, uh, at about, uh, nine, about somewhere in the horizontal axis, just between two o'clock and eight o'clock position. We did the Yamane technique of IOL fixation, and then we did a DMAC. And you can see that even a week's time, the air bubble is now slowly going away. And you can see that the cornea already looks pretty clear. Congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy. Yes, uh, you can do a DMAC without, I did not strip the decimates in this eye, did a DMAC and did well. This is an ice syndrome where I had done a DSEC uh, several years back. I, but now the patient has developed a cataract. The DSEC graph, you can see it's slightly smaller in diameter. Cell count had dropped to about uh, 400. So we decided we went ahead, removed the DSEC graph, did the phaco emulsification, some pupiloplasty, and did a DMAC, and it did pretty well with that. So the advantage of DMAC is that the corneal anatomy is better maintained. Uh, comparison of fellow eyes, uh, where one eye had a DSEC and the other eye DMAC, the cell loss is similar, but if you look at the visual outcome, there is a greater percentage of patients seeing 2020 or better, or 2025 or better. So definitely the patient preference for the eye with the DMAC is much more. In the left, you see a patient, my, one of my patients that have done a DSEC, and the fellow eye, I did a DMAC, and although both eyes are seeing 6 6, when I ask the patient, patient always says that he prefers the eye with the DMAC. And there are recent studies doing comparative analysis, and they have shown that the, the higher order aberrations from the posterior cornea are much lower in DMAC when compared to ultra thin D6. Even combining with intraocular lens surgery, the outcomes are quite favorable. And this is a patient where we did a triple procedure, and you can see three years later, uncorrected 2030. Minimal refractive error and cell count is about 1,323. The biggest advantage for me why I want to do a DMEC as far as possible is the 
significantly lower risk of endothelial rejection. This paper from Price's group in 2012 showed that at one and two years, the risk of endothelial rejection from DMAC was just about 1%. And whereas compared to DMAC, the risk of rejection was with, uh, about eight and 12%, whereas for penetrating keratoplasty was 14 and 18% at one and two years. So DMAC was 15 times lesser and DSEC was, was uh, 20 times lesser risk than PKP. There are several other papers looking at the various rejection rate vary between one to two, two percent. So that's again a very good. So even if you have a non-compliant patient who discontinues steroids, uh, you know, the risk of patient coming back with the rejection are much lower. I usually shift them for full, full strength steroids like prednisolone acetate to using fluoromethylone after six months of doing a DMAC. And they continue with fluoromethylone twice a day. This is a patient. My first patient of DMAC is now finished more than 11 years, still maintaining 2020. And the fellow I, which had a failed graft, I also did a DMAC and he's still doing pretty well. Majority of my cases have been pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. And the next common indication is Fuchs. And the others are various other indications like aphatic bullous keratopathy, failed penetrating keratoplasty, failed DSEC ice syndrome. Almost 65% achieved uh, 2030 or better, out of which 38% had 2020 or better. Because the majority were not Fuchs, I think uh, the residual corneal haze, depending on the extent of pre op corneal edema and pre existing macular pathology, especially chronic CME, were the major limiting factor. Cell loss, again, at one month post op was 20, 23 to 26. At six months, varying between 32 to 35, which is pretty much, I did not encounter any allograft rejection. And if we, and the donor age ranged from uh, as low as 28 to beyond 80. Harvesting success rates were over 98%. In the initial part, we did have conversion only in two eyes. Uh, DM detachment requiring repeat air injection in about 7%. And primary graft failure in the learning curve, we had about nine eyes, 2.4%. Comparing with the data published from the American Academy, our results have been quite comparable. And complication, yes, you can tear the donor decimal, but nothing to worry, you can still use, you can see on the right, that's a donor tissue, which has a large horse tear, but we still use it for DMEC. The second one has a peripheral tear, like an orange peel. So I'll show you what we did in that case. So this is a video showing you uh, donor tissue as we were preparing it. We got a horseshoe tear at one edge, so we started, uh, we came back. So, so the tear was somewhere here. It's not very really vis well visible. So we stained it again. Now you can see this tongue of tissue. That's where the tear is because it was not separating. So we started peeling it from the opposite end and we managed to complete. So a diabetic donor has a tendency for these kind of increased attachment. Sometimes if you get pseudophagic corneal tissue with good cell counts from the eye bank, you should be careful because the areas of the main incision of the side ports, that's where your decimates will be firmly adherent. So try avoiding a pseudophagic tissue from the eye bank. You can use them for DSEC or ultra thin DSEC, but for DMEC, it may not be a great idea. So we finally managed to peel this part off, but we did have a tear. So we then stained it and then we loaded it. You can see, so that there is a tear in the periphery. We loaded it. We tried to get the tear in the posterior part of our donor scroll. We didn't put it at the leading edge and we kept the open end of the scroll at the tip. And then as we inject into the eye, you can see that uh, we are trying to withdraw. And then I inject a little more. My scroll is there into the eye and it remains in the right orientation. It's not trying to run away anywhere. And I remove my AC maintainer, close the wound and then tap. This is the open end of the scroll, peripheral tapping. It ensures that. And I just keep that pin down and then I tap. Here it's slightly caught in the primary wound. We tap here to push it out. Sometimes it might take a small nudge from the main incision as well. So just try gentle tapping periphery and you can see that we were able to get the, you can see that's my F stamp. So it ensures that's in the right orientation. So we tap, 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 tap. And we finally opened up the scroll. You can see that's the large stair you can see here. And once it's in position, we go in and put in our small air bubble first, and then we go in and enlarge the air bubble. So that's the end of surgery. So that's the same patient. You can see that's on day three post-op, and at one month, the cornea looks perfectly clear. This was a case of TAS following a multifocal lens implant. So we did the surgery, and he's doing very well.
This was the page where I had a large tear. I had already stripped nine millimeter on the patient's eye and I had a graft that was much smaller. So it's something like a hemidema. And I didn't have any F stamp or anything in it. So I was wondering what to do. I didn't have a spare tissue as well. So I looked at the orientation of the periphery. So the tissue had to be curling towards me. And once we did that, I tried to place as much as tissue possible in the central visual axis and then went ahead, placed the air bubble. And I was expecting that this patient would have a significant amount of edema in the periphery and that would take a lot of time to clear up. Mentally, I was prepared that when he comes back for his follow-up a month later, he will be unhappy and I will be having to speak to him a lot. But when he came back a month later, you can see, sorry, a month later, you can see that his, this was the strip, the area of the stripping. This was the graph that I put in. But surprisingly, when he came back a month later, I did not see any edema. So maybe his rate of sliding of cells was quite good and his cornea cleared up and he was very happy. He had unaided 2050 and best corrected 2020. The other complication that you can have is uh, donor detachment. Yes, this is not an uncommon finding. If you do an anterior segment OCT and you look at the peripheral edge, the tissue should be curling towards the, corn, the stroma. It shouldn't be curling towards the anterior chamber. So if you have a tissue that's curling towards the anterior chamber, that means that you have a DM in the reverse orientation. So this is the patient, like you can see at one week, the air bubble has become really small and you can see the donor, which was very well attached. Now you can see that there is a generalized separation. So when do you rebubble if the edema involves more than 30% of the cornea or the edema involves the central part of the cornea or if it's a progressive edema, that means you see on day day two, day three, there is some separation. But as you see on day four, day five, the, the separation is worsening. That means you need to rebubble. Or, uh, but, but if you have just a peripheral separation, the central part of the cornea is attached and that's not progressing, you can still watch and uh, the peripheral detachment should spontaneously uh, subside. But if you have a younger donor and the peripheral tissue is curling, then you better watch out because sometimes that curl tissue fibrosis and it never really opens up. So then you have to go in and place an air bubble in the anterior chamber. You can do that in your, some people like doing it on the slit lamp, which is also doable, or you can do it in the, uh, in your LASIK room. You can just uh, under topical anesthesia, put an air bubble and make sure that you can lay under the uh, donor DM and you can place an air bubble. So that's after rebubbling day one. And you can see by day four, the cornea is pretty clear. This is to show you a reverse placement. You can see that uh, the tissue is curling towards the anterior chamber. So this was a reverse placement, a total detachment for which I had to go back and repeat the DM surgery. This was a patient where I had used a younger donor, a 28 year old donor with very good cell count. I thought to myself, I did a great surgery. He went back, came back a month later and on OCT, you can see that there is, the tissue is curling towards the stroma and it's attached only in the center. The peripheral part is separated. So the question was whether I go and remove this and replace it with a fresh donor, but I knew that the cell count was very good. So I went in, put in a small air bubble first, and I did some manipulation with a reverse sense key to try and open up the scroll. So I did touch the DM scroll at some points to get this to open up. And once I opened it up, I put a 20% SS6, and that's how it looked after rebubbling. You can see that the cornea cleared up very fast and the anterior segment OCT looks great. If your patient does not, if you have an uncomplicated surgery, like a triple procedure you have done, you're mighty pleased with yourself. Patient comes back after one month and you're expecting your patient to see 2020. And you look, look at the refraction and you find your patient is reading only 2018, 2020, uh, you know, uh, 80. And you say, why do an anterior uh, macular OCT? You will be surprised to find that there is a, at least a 14% incidence of cystoid macular edema after the MAC. And this could be related to the tapping, duration of the tapping that you do, especially in a hypotonic eye. And the tapping may cause the increased release of cytokines or inflammatory mediators. So that's why in my post-op regime, I try to include a Nevanac uh, NSAID twice a day, at least for a month to try and prevent that. So this is something you need to keep in your mind and you can treat them with Nevanac, but there have been instances, especially in diabetics, where my retina colleague has to give uh, uh, either a steroid injection to try and get this to settle down. 
A chronic cystoid macular edema can also have these kind of macular pathologies, which can limit the uh, outcome of the max surgery. In terms of training, yeah, the cartridge people ask, this is a sensor uh, a three piece IOL cartridge. You can take this cartridge. It's very simple. You take the cartridge, you break off that wings that you have. Yeah, you break off the wing and then take, this is the tubing I've taken from the FACO tubing that you have, or you can use any 14 French catheter. You can take a small piece of the tubing. One edge goes over the edge of the cartridge and the other edge you can attach to a three or a five cc syringe. So that becomes your nice injector, easy to use, cheap. If you try using a three cc syringe because a five cc, because this tubing is very short, if you put a slightly longer tubing, maybe the amount of uh, vacuum generated in the syringe would be less and you will have less tendency for the scroll to go inside the syringe. So use a three cc syringe and you can see that's how you can look at the orientation of the scroll. That's a, a donor tissue that's mounted on the artificial chamber. We have placed a glove to act like the diaphragm. This again uh, is there available on YouTube. You can, I will discuss this at the end and you can place this in. So this is used for practice. So that's how you correct, you, you prepare this, sorry. So basically take the artificial chamber, take the glove, a thin glove, piece of glove, put it on the, base of the artificial chamber, put a donor corneal tissue on top, then close the cap, make your paracentesis main wound. So by injecting fluid through the tubing, which is there in the artificial chamber, you can cause that latex diaphragm to either move up or move down. So when you inject fluid and the diaphragm moves up, it's very similar to shallowing of the anterior chamber. So it helps in manipulating to get the scroll to open up, or if you want to flip the graft or you want to create a deeper chamber, you aspirate some fluid through the, through the tubing and this diaphragm will go down, increasing the space within the anterior chamber. So that's pretty useful to practice the steps of DMEX surgery, like what you do it in the eye. So you place it there, place your suture, and then you can see that you release some fluid from the side port, then you do the tapping. You can pretty much practice all the steps. And this is quite useful <coughs> to do that. And once you've done that, you can go back, you can practice centration and you can practice injecting. So I've done that, now I'm practicing the centration, tapping in the periphery to get the graft to move to the desired position. And then you can practice injecting the air, a small air bubble and then gradually enlarging it. You can even practicing this kind of flipping of the graft, you can see that, you can practice. So basically all the steps you can practice and this can help you overcome the difficulties in your learning curve. But I think that's pretty much about, I do have some slides on the ultra thin DSEC, but I think I've already exceeded my time. I have already uh, one and a half hours. So people may be a little tired of me, listening to me all throughout. So what we wanted to say was that at the end of it, yes, the advantage of DMEC is minimally invasive. You don't need any expensive instrumentation. You have the reverse sense key, the injector you can prepare. The only expensive part is the donor tissue. Uh, it has advantage of faster visual recovery, minimal refractive shift. The risk of rejection is reduced. So compliance of the patient is not an issue. Better utilization if your eye bank or your, your, your legal rules allow you to issue to have to utilize one donor tissue for two patients. And that's what uh, about DMEC and making it easy. And uh, that's my email ID, my WhatsApp, and my channel on YouTube. You can take a snapshot of this with your mobile phone and please feel free to get in touch with me for any queries. I'll be very happy to provide you with any assistance, any difficulties that you have. And there are plenty of videos on YouTube, on my YouTube channel on uh, lamellar keratoplasty. And if you go through them, I'm sh pretty sure you will uh, find them very useful. A lot of the videos that I've shown in this presentation are also available. And there are some live uh, DMEX surgeries that are performed uh, elsewhere at meetings, which are also available on the YouTube channel. So please go back and watch that. And I'm pretty sure whatever I've discussed in this presentation 
uh, you will be able to reinforce that and you will find DMAC to become very easy. Thank you. Thank you all for a very patient hearing. Dr. Rakesh, thank you so much. You have done a, an amazing job this morning here, this afternoon in India. And there is just one question. There is still any indication for a DSEC? Yes. There is still any indication. So I'll be, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to hear your voice. Okay, I'm sorry. You have done an I think, amazing- I think your microphones are, you, they have to unmute your microphones. I don't know why. You, you have me? done- Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm able to hear now much better. I think my microphone was on mute, yes. Okay, you have done an amazing work. Thank you, thank you so much. We are really very, very grateful. And there is just one question. There yes. is any indication to perform DSEC? Yes, so if you want, I can show you some of the slides of ultra thin DSEC, which we'll touch upon if you, it'll take another 10, 15 minutes. If everybody is willing, I can do that. Okay, thanks. Sure, thanks so, so let me try and try and touch upon the I'll ultra thin DSEC. So this is, this is where you cannot do DSEC. You, you go on to ultra thin DSEC. Thank you so much. So the concept of ultra thin DSEC was proposed by Massimo Busin. Massimo is a very, very innovative surgeon. And uh, we, we knew that uh, in DSEC, the thinner the graph, we use the, the better the outcomes and thicker the graph, the longer it would take for visual recovery. And Massimo Busin uh, published this paper on ultra thin DSEC in 2013. And with the microkeratome using a double pass technique, he was able to prepare graphs which were measuring less than 100 microns in thickness. And when, so he used a double pass and he made nomograms. So you use the first uh, pass using a 300 micron head. And after that, you do a pachymetry. And depending on what is the residual stromal bed thickness you have, you use uh, another microkeratome head. So it's an expensive technique. You need to have a lot of uh, microkeratome head composition. Or what we have seen in our series is that we can do a single pass using a 400 micron head and achieve a relatively uh, thinner graph measuring somewhere between 80 to 100 microns. And this is especially for tissues which are stored in optisol because the pre-op pachymetry is slightly lower. And comparison to DSEC and DMAC, the outcomes of ultra thin DSEC have been pretty comparable to DMAC in terms of visual recovery, although DMAC has a slightly faster visual recovery, but if you look at the data at, at one year, the ultra thin DSEC and DMAC are pretty comparable. The, the donor rebubbling rate are also slightly lower with ultra thin DSEC and the cell loss is also pretty comparable. The rejection rates are slightly more than ultra thin, uh, more than DMAC, but uh, it's kind of comparable. We don't have uh, exact data comparing ultra thin, nanothin, and DMAC. So just to show you the donor preparation, so we take the tissue, we mount it on the artificial chamber, we do a pachymetry. So here the pachymetry was 650 micron. We remove the epithelium. Then I'm using a microkeratome. This is a 350 micron head. We do the first pass. And after that, we do another pachymetry and we find that we still have about 210 microns. So now we go with a 90 micron head. We actually flip over the donor tissue. So we don't do the pass from the same side. We rotate the tissue 180 degrees because the when in the first pass, the cut is slightly deeper proximal to the blade and the distal part is slightly thicker. So that's why you flip it over so that you have a slightly thicker area to work with. So you go ahead, use a 90 micron head and you can do the second pass. And after we have done the second pass, we go back with the pachymeter and measure again. And then we find that the thickness is now is about 77 microns. So that's how, and before we punch, it's important that you mark the peripheral edge because when you're marking from the, when you're punching from the endothelial side, your centration is of utmost importance because if you don't center very well, you will end up punching slightly eccentrically 
and then you will have the peripheral stromal tissue make the tissue thicker on one side and thinner on the other side. And we also can create a F stamp or S stamp. And for the surgery, so this was the patient who had a complicated cataract surgery and a lot of iris prolapse. So you see the, there was the peripheral iris loss and doing a DMEC and a lot of Sinecare were there. So we had a younger donor tissue. So we didn't want to do a DMEC, although DMEC was possible. But since this was a donor tissue, my, our eye bank is very, very generous. So sometimes when you ask them a tissue for DMEC, they tell you, yes, we can give you a tissue for DMAC, but the donor is 19 years old. So sometimes we don't have choices. So we take the 19 year, year old donor and I said, I will do a ultra thin DSEC. So we did the pupillar plasty first, did the sinuculysis. You can see we center the graft. We punch out from the endothelial side. Now the tricky part is that this graft is very, very thin. So it doesn't have the stromal rigidity like a normal DSEC graft. So it becomes very difficult to take it to the injector. So you... <clears throat> put a little bit of viscoelastic and kind of trifold it. So it doesn't try to flip over the other side while you are moving it onto. So that's a JANAC uh, inserter, uh, which is the principle is similar to an endoglide where you can close it from the posterior end. It's available from JANAC. This is a Macaluso inserter. You place the tissue into the eye and then because you have the viscoelastic, it's kind of holding the tissue in place slightly. So you irrigate deep in the chamber and then you place an air, but you can see that now it's beginning to open up just a little bit of fluid. Yes. So it doesn't snap open like a normal DSA graph because it's so thin. So it takes a little time, especially if you have put viscoelastic in the interface and then you can place a small air bubble in the anterior chamber. You can stroke the surface. You see the stroking here is different from what you do in the DMAC. So here, you're actually trying to hit golf strokes on the corneal surface, get the tissue to centralize, and then you can enlarge the air bubble to complete the surgery. So that's how it looks post-op. So this is the patient. You can see even within Within five days, this is day five after surgery, the cornea is looking very clear, nice central pupil. And you can't even, on the slip view, you can't even make out the graft uh, as unlike a normal DC graft. That's the thickness on day five. You can see it's in the center part is 69 microns, periphery 76. So that's how an uh, ultra thin DC graft would look. This is again with a single pass where you take a 400 micron head and you can go ahead, do a single pass and achieve the same uh, thickness kind of profile. And this is a very edematous cornea where doing a DMAC would have been quite challenging. So these are kind of cases where visibility is not too great. Uh, here you can do an ultra thin DSEC because you have, you hold the tissue in your micro forceps and you're pulling it in. So you have more control and you have created a mark. And then you can see, you can use slightly lar larger diameter graphs as well. You can see post-op, you can hardly make out the thickness. It goes down to less than 100 microns. You have eye banks in the US that now give you nanothin, which are in the range of about 40, 50 microns. And they use the endosaver injector to inject the, uh, these nanothin graphs. So that's again, something you can go on YouTube and try and take a look at that. So again, one of the DSEC graphs you can see with the secondary eye wall that we had done, ultra thin, looking very great. So these kind of corneas where the cornea is so bad, you can hardly see ultra thin DSEC can help you do an endothelial carboplast in such cases. So again, you can see that we did not, not a very large series, 28 eyes of 28 patients. Uh, we had done, initially we were not using the microkeratome, but we were doing a double pass manual technique. The thickness ranged from 85 to 128, but then we started using the microkeratome, the results were much better. So that's in short about uh, ultra thin DSEC. So if you don't do DMEC, you do ultra thin DSEC. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So now, now, now the first thing you tell me, you think, still think that the DMEC is a difficult surgery? <laughs> <laughs> well, we took, you know, we took the courses, we performed several cases, and sometimes I love the procedures and yes. sometimes. I hate it because sometimes maybe a nightmare, but I think I think it's very important that you should try and record your surgeries as far as possible and always go back and review the video 
especially the unfolding part. And if you have had difficulties at any point, you should review the video with an experienced DMAC surgeon who can look at the video and then give you certain tips. Because if you just verbally ask somebody, it's sometimes it's very difficult for the other person to uh, visualize as to what, what difficulty you may have had. But I think it's very important. And also when you have started doing the surgery, it's, it's, uh, if you go back and then start observing more of DMAC surgery, you will find that you will pay attention to some of the difficulties that you have had and you will try to overcome them much better. There, is, there are many more points in DMEX surgery that we, that, that we need to discuss. So when we do the courses, we spend more time. It's, I've tried to compress everything, all the knowledge that I can provide within this webinar that I, I could to the best of my ability. But I think uh, we break down the surgery into individual steps right from donor preparation, wound construction. And then along with that, when you do a wet lab uh, with this knowledge that you have, I think it completes... So for me, I, I try to do that from the courses that we run. It's a two-day course, but in two days, you have more time. So we talk a lot. We try to understand and make sure that you understand the basic concepts. When you go back, you go back with the, with the, with the knowledge of... So, so when you're doing a particular step of unfolding, you should not do it just because you, somebody else, you saw somebody else do it. You should know the scientific reasoning behind why you are tapping at one point and why you are tapping at the other side. How, so what happens when you tap? Once you understand that, the surgery will become really easier. When you don't know why you are tapping, that is when it becomes difficult because it works sometimes and sometimes the same maneuver doesn't work. Okay, thank you so much. It was an honor for us and really I hope to see you in Buenos Aires next October. Thank you so much. Definitely, it's a pleasure. It will always be a pleasure to visit you and share more. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. A todos eh, les agradezco el, el, el haber compartido, en especial a Arrakesh Fogla, to share with us your knowledge. Thank you so much.